from spectrum to molecular formula to structure dear students today i am recording this lecture just to help you how to elucidate structure of a given compound on the basis of the spectral data on the basis of the spectroscopic data so here we want to go from mass spectrum to molecular formula and from molecular formula to structure so this is simple many of the concepts that i am going to talk about today we have already studied okay but i am making the things easy and simple okay so it is kind of uh, uh, making things easy okay so so let's go ahead okay what's this this is a mass spectrum okay now look at this mass spectrum what do you see definitely you see peaks and there are many peaks okay my question today is is it possible for us to determine molecular formula on the basis of just this simple mass spectrum the answer is no nowadays we we have another type of mass spectrometry that is known as high resolution mass spectrometry or hrms and on the basis of that taking into account all the isotopic masses it is reasonably possible that from a high resolution mass spectrum we predict the molecular formula of a compound but from the ordinary mass spectra that we generally have these mass spectra we cannot determine the molecular formula unless we have other information with us like what are the different elements present in this compound and how many atoms of each element present in this compound are there okay and similarly other things like uh, functional groups what are the functional groups present in this molecule and so on okay so on the basis of mere mass spectrum or simple mass spectrum or just mass spectrum ordinary mass spectrum i mean is it's not possible okay but we have very important information here this is the molecular ion peak and this tells us the molecular mass okay so the question is if we know the molecular mass and of course some other information then can we elucidate the molecular formula of a compound the answer is yes okay let's see here on this slide we have some concepts which we have already gone through for example this hdi or the hydrogen deficiency index which is also known as degree of unsaturation or unsaturation number etc we already know this what is hdi what is its importance how can we calculate it okay if a hydrocarbon is saturated that is if it is an alkene okay then we know that it will have certain number of carbons and because carbon forms four bonds 
so there will certainly be a certain number of hydrogens. So we know that what is the general formula of alkanes. And if our compound has a carbon-carbon double bond, then of course for each double bond there will be two hydrogens less and so on. And similarly, if we have a ring, a cycle in our compound, then for each cycle, there will be two hydrogens less. So we already know this. We already know this. Okay. So this slide gives us a general equation. So this is a general equation which we can use to calculate HDI for most of the compounds that we deal with in organic chemistry. Okay, so this is a very simple formula and you can easily apply it, use it and calculate what? Calculate HDI. Suppose we have a compound whose molecular mass is 117 and molecular formula is this C8 H7N. Okay, so we already know this molecular formula. We already know this molecular formula. So based on this molecular formula, how can we calculate HDI? So use this equation. Okay, so you have two and then multiplied by the number of carbons, which are eight here, and then plus two from the formula and then plus number of nitrogens. Here we have one nitrogen, so plus one. Then minus the number of hydrogens. We have seven hydrogens here. And then minus X mean the halogens, number of halogen atoms. So here we don't have any, so minus zero. So you work up and you will find this answer. And you can have any other, this type of the, Molecular formula and you can calculate HDI. Just remember one thing if oxygen is present in your compound, just ignore it. Okay, for example, you have this molecule C9H8O4. Okay, and you are asked to calculate its HDI. Okay, how can you do it? Just use this formula, okay? And ignore oxygen. And when you will be doing this, you will be getting your HDI. So this is a simple way to calculate HDI, okay? And you should do a lot of practice so that you are well-versed and strong in calculating HDI, okay? Okay, now here, don't be scared by this slide. A lot of things are written only because I want you to have everything in front of your eyes. Okay, here we have this data with us. We have a molecule and its mass spectrum shows a peak at 96, M over Z, 96. So that is the molecular mass of this substance. This substance has one carbon-carbon double bond and it also has one ring. So this is the data that we already know, okay? We already know that this is a compound Okay, having this types of uh, things there, a ring is there, a carbon-carbon double bond is there, and its molecular ion peak appears at 96 M over Z. So this is the data with us. Now, broadband decoupled C13 NMR spectrum is also given. What is broadband decoupled? 
C13 spectrum, broadband mean just the normal C13 spectrum. Okay, and depth 90 is also given and depth 135 is also given. Okay, so this is the broadband decouple C13 NMR spectrum. It gives us the carbons, all the carbons present in a molecule. When we say all, we actually mean all the, the sets of equivalent carbon. That is all kinds of carbons which are equivalent. So the all the different sets of equivalent carbons. So we have how many peaks here in C13? One, two, three, four, and five. So five peaks are there. Look at the chemical shifts values also. We already know that uh, which range or which region of chemical shifts tell us what, which groups probably are present there, which carbon, which C13 carbon actually will be giving a signal in that region. So we know and uh, so keep the chemical shifts also in mind. Now, here depth 19 gives no peaks. Okay, there are no peaks in depth 90. What does this mean? It means there is no CH group. There, there is no methane carbon in this molecule. Okay, no CH, no CH. Depth 135, no positive peaks. Negative peaks are here, here and here but no positive peaks. Now in depth 135, which carbons give positive peak? Methane carbon and methyl carbon, yes. The carbons having odd number of hydrogens, methane and methyl. So in this particular compound, the depth 135 says, there is no positive peak. Means this molecule does not have a methyl group also. So it does not have a methane and it does not have a methyl. So it means we have other things. In the depth, in the depth we can only tell about those carbons which have protons, that is the protonated carbons, okay? The proton bearing carbons. So here are the proton bearing carbons. This, 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 and this. So it means they all are CH2s. They all are CH2s. Okay, if we compare these with this normal C13 spectral peaks, so what's the difference, okay? Which peak is absent here, okay? Here, yes, this one, 149.7. This peak is not appearing, this hasn't appeared in which? In depth. So which carbon does not appear in depth? Quaternary carbon, a carbon having no hydrogen. So it means this is such a compound which has no methane, no methyl, and has one quaternary carbon somewhere, the carbon having no hydrogen, and four, four methyl carbons are four sets of methyl carbons, we can say this. Okay, so these are the data that we already have with us. And now keeping all these things in mind, let's move ahead and see how can we solve this riddle, okay? 
this puzzle how can we solve it okay it's easy if we go step by step okay step by step understanding each and every point it's easy okay don't be scared it's just easy okay we do not know its molecular formula we know these things but we don't know the molecular formula of this compound so we have to determine it how can we do this so there is a rule called rule of 13 so here today our focus is to learn this new thing that is rule of 13 so what's the rule of 30 rule of 13 okay what's the atomic mass of carbon okay 12 what's the atomic mass of hydrogen one so this is how we have a 13 the number 13 and we are now going today to learn rule of 13 rule of 13. organic compounds must have carbon we know this that uh, all organic compounds have carbon mostly they also have hydrogen okay so we can say that at least they have one carbon and one hydrogen or any multiple of this okay any multiple of this so we know the general formula of alkenes alkenes and alkynes also so these are their general formulas okay we already know these things and now what we do rule of 13 is simple just what is the molecular mass of your compound okay for example a or b or for example in this particular compound the molecular mass is 96 so what should we do just divide your molecular mass by 13 okay it's simple rule of 13 is simple divide your molecular mass by 13 and as a result you will be having these things you will be having a number that is known as a numerator and you will be having a, a another number that is the remainder okay remainder okay based on this then your base formula will be this okay possibly your molecular formula but some more work we are going to do on this and this is called base formula cn hn plus r what is n n is the numerator okay when we divide the molecular mass of our compound by 13 we get a number and a remainder this numerator number is n and the remainder is denoted by r and this is just a simple formula okay now in our problem we have molecular mass 96 so divide it by 13 you will be doing this 96 divided by 13 so you will get then n is equal to 7 remainder will be 5 so the possible Markov formula or strictly speaking the base formula will be this okay and so we have this c 7 h 12 okay just simple molecular mass divided by 13 and you will be having a numerator and remainder just simple okay and use this formula this, this one okay remember remember from the data that our compound has a carbon carbon double bond and a ring this this is the knowledge that we already have now see what inference we can get from nmr okay look at depth 90 okay we have already talked about this and then carefully study depth 135 and you will be getting certain information compare depth 
with broadband decoupled C13, and you will be getting another information. That is the information about what? About quaternary carbons. Okay, so C13 NMR shows five signals, but our molecule has seven carbons. Okay, good. Okay, using this technique and this data, we have come to this formula that is, it is having how many carbon? Seven carbons. But C13 broadband decoupled spectrum, this shows that there are five carbons. It means what? It means what? It means some carbons are equivalent. Some carbons are equivalent. Okay, so we have one quaternary carbon that is at 149.7 ppm. All other carbons are CH2s. One CH2 is very down field, that is uh, 106.9. Okay. And because our, carb our this compound has a carbon-carbon double bond, and because we do not have any CH and CH3s, and so the only possibility is that we should have a this type of thing. This CH2 should be like this. So a doubly bonded carbon CH2. And this, if we have this CH2, which is very downfield, and this chemical shift shows that this is a carbon that is the alkene carbon having a uh, protons with it. So this cannot be in a ring, okay? This CH2 having a double bond cannot be in a ring because if uh, there is a double bond in a ring, then the number of hydrogens that that carbon can have maximum is one. The carbon attached to it cannot be and a carbon attached to this, uh, this cannot be CH. Why? Because there is no CH in our compound. It cannot uh, uh, be CH2. Why? Because if CH2 is attached with this CH2, then that will be a separate uh, compound. A separate compound. So, only one possibility is there. That is, this CH2 is attached with a quaternary carbon. So here is a quaternary carbon. And so the quaternary carbon then will be attached with other carbons and other carbons are only what? Only CH2s, CH2s. And so in this way, all those CH2s are bonded together, making a ring and the quaternary carbon is bonded to this CH2 through this double bond here. So on the basis of all these considerations, all these considerations, one by one, using the rule of 13, finding out the Mulker formula, the base formula and the Mulker formula, and counting the number of carbons in C13 and MR spectrum, and comparing it with the depth spectra, okay, and ruling out the things one by one, and uh, explaining our data, rationalizing our conclusions, ultimately we come to where, okay? We come to where. Here. So this is the possible structure, okay? And you can see that uh, uh, it has this um, uh, methylene carbon, which is very downfield. And here, this is the double bond. This is the quaternary carbon. And so this is how you can see the other CH2s. Okay. Can you justify that these assignments are correct? Okay. I have done these assignments for you. And I want you to justify them. That is, uh, have I assigned these values to these carbons correctly or not? Okay. This is you need to do. Okay. Let's go into another example. A beautiful example, and we are going to do the same thing. That is using all that strategy and to determine the structure. Okay, this is a compound. This is the mass spectrum, and this mass spectrum has a, a molecular ion peak here. 
okay and this also has a uh, this um, base peak at 68 and there are other peaks as well okay but we know that we don't have to interpret each and every peak in a mass spectrum okay we just focus on the major peaks and particularly the molecular ion peak and the base peak okay so we have this um, mass spectrum with us we have this uh, ir spectrum with us and on the next page we also have a, a proton nmr spectrum and a c13 nmr spectrum so we will be going through these spectra one by one and trying to elucidate the structure of our compound okay this is a compound whose mass spectrum is given to us and in this mass spectrum we have this molecular ion peak okay and we don't have any other information except these spectra okay look at the ir okay what is the information that we can gather from ir ir okay look at this peak it's a very very prominent peak here and it is at 1685 per centimeter very prominent very strong peak this tells us that this compound has a carbonyl carbonyl group but carbonyl can be an aldehyde carbonyl can be ketonic carbonyl can be ester and in amide and carboxylic acid etc so we have uh, carbonyl groups in many types of compounds so which this okay okay look at this and we are here to know that whether this carbonyl group is aldehydic or ketonic or maybe it is a carbonyl of an ester or a carbonyl of a amide etc etc okay what information do we have okay here this part tells us that we do not have a carboxylic hydroxyl group okay so carboxylic acid is ruled out do we have um, pos the possibility of having this amide we know that amide carbonyl is present somewhere here but in that case we should have some other things in our molecule okay for example we should have what we should have what so so amide mean we have a nitrogen but uh, uh, what about this uh, the molecular ion peak in our compound is it even or odd it is um, even so uh, most probably there is no nitrogen of course there is no odd number of nitrogens but the chances of even number is there but because it is comparatively a small molecule and uh, we do not expect a nitrogen here in this molecule so one possibility is that this molecule does not have a nitrogen so this carbonyl is not an amide okay this carbonyl cannot be an ester why because ester carbonyls are generally very here on the left at about uh, 1700 
40 are around that. So it is not that. So it means it is not an ester as well. What about an aldehyde? Okay, an aldehyde. So the easy, the quick test, whether this is an aldehyde or not, we should go to the next spectrum. That is the, which spectrum? Proton NMR. In proton NMR, here you can see, we don't have a aldehydic proton, so it is not an aldehyde either. So, what is the possibility? Okay, look at this peak, okay? Here you have this uh, 3000, your demarcation line, a very important line. And on the left of this line, you have this important absorption, this signal, and this signal is uh, because of carbon hydrogen stretching. Which carbon? sp2 hybridized and if this is the correct assumption that we have made then we should have a carbon carbon stretching here okay at 1600 something and so we have it so it means that we have a carbon carbon double bond also here and that carbon carbon double bond also the doubly bonded carbon also has a hydrogen with it. Okay, carbon-carbon double bond is uh, indicated by this peak and sp2 carbon-hydrogen double bond is indicated by this. And this uh, uh, carbonyl group, if it is ketonic, then this value is uh, less for it because ke generally the ketonic carbonyl appears at uh, around 1710 per centimeter. But if it appears at a lower value, that indicates, that indicates what? Conjugation, conjugation, conjugation. That is that carbonyl is uh, in conjugation with a carbon-carbon double bond. So based on these pieces of information, okay, we have now certain conclusions. That is, this molecule whose molecular formula we don't know, but has this molecular mass, and this is such a compound which has carbon, which has hydrogens, and which also has oxygen. And that oxygen is most probably what? that oxygen is most probably a ketonic carbonyl oxygen and that carbonyl is then in conjugation with the carbon-carbon double bond. So keeping this information in mind and suppose now we can say that this is the molecular, molecular mass of a compound and this compound has only one, car, uh, one oxygen so we can go this way. Since there is one oxygen, so 96, 96 minus 16 is equal to 80. And 80 divided by 13, okay? That is what we are going to do is, we are now using the rule of 13. So we come to this, okay? And so N is equal to six, R is equal to two, putting these values in over this formula, we have already learned in the previous slide, we get this. So this is what is our base formula, including oxygen into it. So we have this, our molecular formula. So this is the most probable or the possible molecular formula C6H8O, okay? So write these six and eight as a subscript. Okay, now based on these informations, we can say that um, this is the molecular formula, but in this we have this type of the things, that is a carbonyl and that is in conjugation with a carbon-carbon double bond. So this is the conclusion up till now, 
and let's uh, go to the next uh, and see what information we are getting from these uh, NMR spectra. Okay, NMR spectra. NMR spectra is again very simple. This is this is our C13 and um, showing us depth values as well. Okay, so this is CH2, this is CH2, this is CH2. Okay, no CH3 here. This is CH, this is CH, and here we have a quaternary carbon. This quaternary carbon is because of the carbonyl, and then we have a carbon-carbon double bond having CH groups, and then we have CH2s bonded together, and so this is the knowledge that we can get from where? From the C13 NMR spectrum okay and the depth values okay this is our what our proton nmr spectrum here you can see this is a ch2 and here we have two ch2s okay we can say that this is a kind of triplet but there a overlapping this is an accidental overlapping of the two ch2 groups here they are two ch2 separate two ch2 groups but uh, Coincidentally, they have almost uh, not equal but very similar chemical shift values. And here we also have a CH and a CH, and these are in the form of a doublet. And they, this um, doublet is a, this is a doublet, and this is a then further uh, divided into uh, other peaks. Other peaks mean um, it is doublet because of a nearby CH, but then that doublet is split up uh, into a multiplet because that is attached to a another group that is CH2. So based on all these data, we can say that this is a molecule and it has a this type of the bonding and it has uh, one, two, three CH2s. And, and then it also has one and two of these uh, CHs and also has a carbonyl. Carbonyl is then bonded uh, in a manner that you have this conjugation. So step by step solving this puzzle, ultimately we come to this compound. So this is the structure of this compound. And uh, so we followed the rule of 13 to elucidate its molecular formula and then on the basis of the information uh, that we get from uh, mass spectrum, IR spectrum, C13 spectrum along with the depth and proton NMR spectrum and this is the structural formula of this compound. Okay, now let's go back and have another interesting thing in the mass spectrum, the base peak is this. Now the question is, how can we explain the formation of this base peak, 68, okay, 68. So you subtract, subtract uh, 68 from 96 and you will be getting something and let's see how can we do this, okay. This is how this ring breaks up, okay? And breaks up, this electron pair goes here, this electron pair goes here, this electron pair goes here, and as a result, it breaks up, and we get this radical cation and this neutral molecule that is lost. Okay, the mass of this is uh, 28. So when 28 goes out from 96, we get 68 and 68 is a very stable uh, peak, a peak, very intense peak that is representing a very stable uh, radical cation and that is, and that is, uh, and this is formed, uh, this is formed because of this cleavage and this cleavage is known as retro Diels-Elder reaction. 
retro deals elder reactions so remember that retro deals elder reaction also occurs if possible in the ionization chamber of a mass spectrometer and as a result we get uh, these peaks so this is how we can explain the formation of uh, this uh, peak at uh, mz68 okay i hope that now you will be able to follow this types of the strategy and find out the structure of different compounds.